Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today, we're setting out on a quest. A quest that's equal parts engineering, archaeology, and just a little bit of insanity. Because somewhere in the depths of all this vintage iron lies a challenge that will test our patience and determination. We're going to bring the PDP-1183 to life using the very largest hard drive the deck ever dared to ship for the PDP, the formidable RA-73. But that's not all. Our real goal is to load up BSD Unix and watch it boot from the real drive, if everything goes according to plan, that is. And here's the thing about vintage tech like this, nothing ever goes according to plan. There will be mysteries to unravel, quirks to outwit, and let's face it, a fair chance that we'll be digging through old manuals that are older than some of you that are watching. But if we pull it off, we'll have a completely vintage system booting vintage software off a huge vintage drive. And to understand why this is such a big deal, let me set the stage. Back in the early days of computing, storage was expensive. When the PDP-11 launched in the 70s, even a few megabytes of hard drive space was a real luxury. In fact, here are a few good examples. On my own PDP-1134, we can find three hard drives. The first is a removable RK-05, which has cartridges that you can swap in and out, and they hold one megabyte each. Now, one megabyte may not sound like a lot of memory, and it isn't, but the entire address space of this machine is only 64K, so when you think of it in those terms, it's perhaps not as surprising. The next two drives are fixed, but they use very similar cartridges inside. But because they're fixed instead of removable, I guess, they can use a denser storage scheme and they manage to get two megabytes out of each of these drives. These are the ones that you would boot a system like RT11 from. To get much larger for storage, we're going to have to move ahead a few years, from the late 70s to the late 80s. Because by that time, DEC had modernized the electronics of the PDP-11 to use large-scale integration chips. And the machines had become physically smaller. At the same time, storage needs and capacities had started to grow. So let's take a look at a 1982 PDP-1183 as a good example. On the left side of the PDP-11's desk enclosure can be found a pair of DEC RL02 drives. Each of these removable cartridges features 10 megabytes of storage. Inside the machine is a DEC MFM controller connected to an old Seagate ST251 drive for another 10 megabytes. Everything in those days seemed to top out around 10 megabytes, or so it seemed. Fast forward to about 1990 and DEC engineers decided to go big. 2,000 megabytes big, with a drive known as the RA-73. Now, 2 gigabytes might sound laughable today, but on a PDP-11, that's like putting a jet engine on a tricycle. It's basically infinite space. I'd heard of the RA-73, as by now they were legendary for their capacity. Except, beyond references in the code and documentation, I'd never actually seen one. And then about a month ago, one of them popped up on eBay. The only problem was that it was untested, it used a completely proprietary custom controller interface that I did not have, it required special cables, and it would not physically fit into my PDP-11's case. Not to mention that I wasn't even entirely sure whether it was intended for the PDP-11 or if it were maybe for the later VAX series. And yet I bought the drive anyway and started asking questions online and reading the archive manuals to see what I could figure out. As with any vintage tech project, merely acquiring the hardware is only the beginning. Now, the RA-73 is no ordinary drive. It's a full-height, 5.25-inch behemoth with 21 heads. When it powers up, you can feel it in your chest as much as you hear it in your ears. A glorious mix of howls, clunks, and the occasional terrifying sound that tells you the drive is alive and very much ready for work. Now, this thing was built to withstand the rigors of institutional use, universities, research labs, and even government installations. It's durable. And here I am, 40 years later, trying to make it boot BSD Unix. Now, if you're thinking I just plugged this bad boy into the PDP-11 and turned it on in the BIOS, well, you clearly haven't worked with vintage hardware, because it's not that simple. The RA-73 uses an interface called SDI, short for Standard Disk Interface. This was DEC's in-house competitor to SCSI, but unlike SCSI, which connects all the devices in a chain, SDI uses dedicated radial cables. Each drive gets its own dedicated connection to the controller like the spokes on a wheel. In fact, each drive also has two ports, so each drive can be connected to two different controllers. It's all very elegant in theory, but in practice you need the right cables, connectors, and critically, the right disk controller. Enter the KDA-50. The KDA-50 is the unsung hero of this story. It's a two-board set that interfaces directly with SDI drives like the RA-73. Of course, just finding a KDA-50 was a saga in itself. I scoured forums and auction sites and even called in a few favors from other vintage computing enthusiasts. When I finally tracked one down, it came with what I'd call a partial kit. The boards were intact, but the interboard connectors were missing and the drive cables were long gone. You see, SDI cables aren't your average ribbon or IDE cables. 
Each pair of wires is shielded with coax, making them nearly impossible to replicate without some skills and the proper tools. A viewer graciously donated the interconnect cables that I needed for the KDA50 boards, but even then I was still missing these fancy coax cables which were the final piece of the puzzle. They are the internal cable to link the board to the drive itself. And after weeks of searching, I struck gold. I found a proper internal SDI cable that looked like it had been sitting in somebody's basement since the Reagan administration. And it smelled faintly of incense, but it was intact and that's all that mattered to me. With the cable in hand, I could finally assemble the system. So I did and I powered everything on, but nothing happened. An LED lit on the drive, but it didn't spin up. And that's when I suspected maybe it was the power supply, since I was just using a little brick-style charger with a hard drive power moldex, and it's probably only good for 2 amps on the 12 volt. I have no idea how much power it takes to spin up the big boy, and the label doesn't even say, but I could easily see it being more than 2 amps. So I dug out an external full height 5 and a quarter inch drive enclosure to get proper power, when originally intended for large SCSI drives. That means it has a power supply capable of running two large drives, so it should be able to power my one big one. But I set it all up, connected the drives, powered it up, and still nothing. Either the drive was truly dead, or they simply don't automatically spin up when they're powered, while almost every other drive from MFM to RLL to IDE to SCSI to SATA seems to spin up with just power connected. Maybe the SDI drives don't. I had no real idea, but I decided to forge ahead nonetheless. I'd already become pretty familiar with the deck diagnostics for the KDA50 as I had repeatedly tested just the controller boards while I was making the new interconnect cables to go between them. But now I had the drive, albeit seemingly dead, connected as well, so I was curious to see what would happen this time. And the diagnostics at least got far enough to see the drive, but to nobody's surprise at all, since it still had not spun up, it got no response from reading them from the drive, and so the tests would all fail. In my mind, either this drive was truly DOA or it was, best case, maybe suffering from a case of what's known as stiction. What's stiction? Well, some Seagate drives were prone to it back in the 90s, and it's a phenomenon where when the drive sits powered off for a long time, the heads kind of settle down into the layer of lubricants that covers the disc platters. Given enough time, or maybe a too thick coat of lubricant, then the heads will stick to the platters and prevent them from starting to turn. The old fix was to break open the drive, free it up by hand, and then put the case back on. Any smarter man would then immediately back up their data and retire that drive, not only for the stiction problem itself, but for the fact that they've just opened the drive, broken the hermetic seal, and let all kinds of dog hair and dust and who knows what into the thing. But not me, not as a teenager. When it happened to me all those years ago, I just left the case loose and then spun it up each day by hand, and yet it still never failed. And it's probably experiences like that that tend to make me a little too bold with electronics for some people's tastes. But I do get lucky sometimes, it seems. Anyway, back to the RA-783, I decided that while I had never even heard of deck drives having stiction problems, anything was possible since the drive had been sitting on a shelf for about 30 years. Plus it has 21 heads, that's a lot of stiction area to stick if it was stiction. And so, bold man that I am, I started to remove a screw from the drive's outer case. And better yet, I hadn't even unplugged it, so how's that for bold and careless? Well, it also happens to be clever and fortuitous, because as soon as I cracked one screw loose, guess what? I heard a clunk sound and the drive spun up. I immediately just tightened the screw back up and so the seal was still intact and I think the drive will probably be reliable going forward. I think the stiction was a one-time thing from decades of rest, but time and experience will be the final arbiters of that one. In the meantime, I checked with the seller discovered that they even had a second drive under their bed, so I bought that one too and now I have a spare just in case. But here's where the real story begins, because you see, hardware is only half the battle. The software, specifically BSD Unix, was about to put up a fight. Booting a custom 211 BSD kernel on vintage hardware is a challenge in and of itself, but booting it from an RA-73? That's the kind of problem that keeps you up at night, surrounded by terminal windows, manuals, and cups of coffee. As anybody who's worked with vintage systems knows, if acquiring the hardware is akin to your decision to climb Everest, then getting the hardware operational is like reaching base camp. The actual climb begins when the software gets involved. Now, I started with a known good setup, a Cubone. If you're unfamiliar with it, the Cubone is a modern emulator. It's a card that plugs into the PDP-11 and allows you to boot off PDP-11 disk images stored on an SD card. It's fantastic for testing and debugging, but it's not vintage. My goal was to replace the Cubone entirely with the real RA-73 so the system would run on entirely period correct hardware from start to finish. Step one then, boot into 211 BSD from the Cubone, get the system running, and then see if it can even see the RA-73. And this is where I hit the first wall. The system would boot from the boot block, which would then read the kernel in from the root file system and start executing it. It would then panic, which is the Unix equivalent of a Windows blue screen. 
It just said SW size and dropped to the machine language monitor process. I looked for that message in the kernel sources and I found it right in main. And yes, for the curious, there's actually a C function called main in the kernel code where it all begins. And one of the first things the kernel does is check that swap space is a valid size and it was getting some kind of negative value instead. And that's all I could tell. If I booted the version of BSD that comes with the popular PyDP11 kit, it would work. But if I booted my custom BSD with all the additional hardware support, it would crash. And so I tried to use those as bookends, working my way forward one step at a time from the working system to see if I could spot which step in the process caused the issue, while also working backwards from the end, reverting steps to see if I could get it to work before the issue. Unfortunately, I couldn't solve it. The odd thing was that this identical image boots fine in the other PDP-1183, just not in the mock-up system with the new controller. So I simplified the machine down to just CPU and RAM and the Cubone, and it still wouldn't boot. I even got Clem, the friendly Unix wizard, on FaceTime to chat about it, but we couldn't solve it. And that's when I decided that even though it made no real sense, I would swap the CPU and RAM between the working and the non-working machines. And that didn't solve it. I tried a different backplane, which also did not solve it. So at this point, literally the only thing different was the actual Cubone being used, and so I swapped the two Cubones, and the problem followed one with Cubones. I even swapped the SD cards then between the Cubones, assuming it was probably an image problem, but, you know, it was the card itself. But it definitely seems to be one particular Cubone card, so that card will go in the Fix Me pile for now, and we'll move ahead with my spare Cubone. Because remember, kids, when it comes to things like the Cubone that you can't get easily, two is one, and one is none. Once I had the machine booting again, it was time to configure and build a custom BSD kernel. This step, which takes about 90 minutes, is needed because 2.11 BSD didn't do loadable drivers or anything fancy like that. If you wanted to enable a particular kind of hardware support, you had to change if defs in the code and rebuild the actual kernel source. I primarily did this to enable the additional controller since I was adding the big KDA50 but also keeping the existing RQDX3 that controls the MFM drive in there. Next, I increased the number of MSCP drives, which is just the category of drive used for both of these controllers, and the default total was too low. Then I tweaked some of the actual BSD source to do things like increasing the number of available mount points, as I already knew from experience that the defaults were going to be insufficient for my setup. While the drive was spinning and the KDA50 was reporting everything as fine during diagnostics, BSD just didn't seem to know it existed. No entries for the drive in the dev folder, no love from the kernel, nothing. Now when faced with this kind of problem, you have two choices. The first is to panic and start flipping switches and typing commands and hoping for a miracle. The second and usually more productive approach is to dig into the system's documentation and figure out what it's expecting. Fortunately, I had an offline copy of the BSD kernel documents, which are known as the source code. Unfortunately, it also reads like stereo instructions written by somebody who's been awake for about 48 hours. I mean, the code isn't really complicated, but it's very terse and there's very few comments. After a day or two of playing with the base addresses and interrupt vectors of the various controllers to get them to coexist nicely, I could get the drive to appear, but not to respond. The first thing you do under BSD once you get a drive connected is to edit the partition table that defines the layout of data on the drive, but the required disk label command refused to talk to my drive. Hoping against hope, I asked my custom chat GPT instance that I have primed with a lot of the old deck manuals. But as of a few months ago, it seemed that ChatGPT knew very little about the old BSD systems, and it would just hallucinate convenient commands that we both wished existed but didn't. But today, ChatGPT was on, and the key, it turns out, was to add a custom disk entry to the BSD configuration files. You see, BSD systems in those days didn't automatically recognize drives. You had to describe them in excruciating detail. Things like the numbers of cylinders, heads, sectors, even specific quirks of the drive's geometry, its RPM spin rate, everything. It's the kind of work that makes modern plug-and-play systems seem kind of magic. And after a few hours of trial and error, I managed to get the RA-73 finally visible to the kernel. Progress at last. But there was a catch, because there's always a catch. While the system could see the drive, it still would not let me partition it. Every attempt to use the disk label command came back with a cryptic partition in use error. And the partition was not in use. It wasn't mounted. I hadn't even touched it. But it's the Unix equivalent of the DMV telling you that your paperwork isn't quite in order, but refusing to say exactly why. So I turned to ChatGPT again, and it did not fail to impress. I described the issue, and it came back with a simple but genius suggestion. Use DD to wipe out the partition table. Whatever was on the disk now was making the disk label program angry, so let's just literally zero out that part of the disk, and maybe that will humor it. <laughs> 
For those unfamiliar, DD is the Unix equivalent of a sledgehammer. It doesn't ask questions, it just writes exactly what you tell it and where to write it. And by overwriting the first several blocks of the drive with zero, I effectively erased any remnants of the old partition tables. That cleared the way for a fresh dislabel command and this time it worked. The drive was now partitioned and ready for the next step. Now I actually had two partitions to deal with, the boot partition and the much larger user partition where all the source code in that lives. The standard method for transferring data between disks on BSD involves using the utilities dump and restore, but here's the kicker. Those old original tools require a temporary location to store an intermediary copy of the data. And with no spare drives in the system, I was stuck. I couldn't dump the data because there was nowhere to put it. I was going from a 1GB virtual image to a 2GB physical drive, and my only storage was on 10 megabyte cartridges of which it would take a few hundred, which suffice to say I do not have on hand. So cue ChatGPT a third time, and its solution? Use tar to stream the data directly from one partition to another. So you actually have two instances of tar running, and the first one scours the source drive, and it sends its output through a pipe to the second instance, which prints some status, and then writes the files to the new drive. Because if you're wondering, you can't just use the CP or copy command, because it doesn't preserve all the file attributes, and it blindly follows links and so on. Whereas tar was intended for tape backup, so it's smart enough to handle and recreate what it can find on a disk. Using tar preserved all the links, permissions, metadata, basically everything that makes a Unix file system tick. It was a thing of beauty watching the data flow from the Cubone to the RA-73 and the drive roaring away, all without a hitch. Fascinated, I think I watched and listened to it for about an hour before going out that evening. And when I got back several hours later, it had completed. Of course, it wasn't all smooth sailing. There were still some minor hiccups like having to tweak the fstab file to ensure that the RA-73 was mounted correctly at boot and dealing with a few cryptic errors that actually turned out to be typos in my configuration. But after a couple of days, and I do mean days, I finally had the system ready. The moment of truth was upon me. Could I boot directly into BSD from the RA-73? I powered down the PDP-11, disconnected and removed the Cubone entirely, and then flipped the switches to boot from the SDI controller. The RA-73 spun up, clunked ominously, and then nothing. Well, not quite nothing, but it turned out that I had missed a crucial step, copying the bootloader itself to the drive's boot partition. After a quick fix with disk label dash B, the system finally booted cleanly. And for the first time ever, I had a fully vintage PDP-11 running BSD Unix from a period correct RA-73 drive. You wouldn't think that where you boot an old machine from would make much of a difference. After all, people run their Commodore 64s and similar old computers off SD cards, so why not the PDP? But there's something special about running a fully vintage system on spinning rust and knowing that it's not relying on any modern magic. Somehow, I just like it better. If you've enjoyed today's little PDP-11 adventure, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thanks. Please be sure to turn on the bell icon so that you get reminders of my random release schedule. If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, link in the video description. It's everything I know now about living your best life on the spectrum that I wish I had known long ago. Be sure to check out our weekly podcast called Shop Talk and host it on the Dave's Attic channel. Since we're hosting it on the second channel, not that many people have seen it yet, but I hope you find that it's worth looking for in the video description, or just search for Dave's Attic where you'll find the latest episodes. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Are you smoking yet? Do it, Glenn. Do it, do it.